Wow, you guys are like primed. Someone walks to the mic and everyone just comes down. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Nikkei Blake. I am the new, your new uh, graduate dean. I've been here for about 114 days, and I am thrilled to be here at this particular event. So this is the first time I've seen this many people in a room, this many students in a room. So this is really exciting for me. And, and everyone tells me that this is an awesome event, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. As many of you, as many of us are gathered here in person, in place, on our campus, I'm doing, I'm sorry, I should tell you, I'm doing a land acknowledgement right now. As many of us gather here in person, in place, on our campus in San Francisco, we want to acknowledge the Ramatush Olomu people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We respect the Ramatush Olomu elders, past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF sits on, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatosh Olome community for their stewardship and support. We look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Thank you. <clears throat> We're so glad to be able to bring this event back in person after a two-year pandemic-induced hiatus. Since, as I indicated, this is my first time, I'm going to have just a small role because I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no template for this. Um, I've heard a lot about it, and it appears to be a fun event. I see lots of t-shirts, lots of signs, lots of, so I, I am expecting to hear lots of celebration, nothing more like it. Grand Slam, Grand Slam is first and foremost for the benefit of our PhD students. We hope that the skills of the students um, that you will see today, the skills that they have acquired in preparing and practicing to give their talks, and the poise that they will gain from participating in this very difficult communication challenge will serve them well as they move towards their eventual careers. But there is also a selfish reason for Grad Slam. Grad Slam gives all of us a glimpse at the fascinating and important research of our students at UCSF. So thank you to all the finalists. Why don't we just celebrate our finalists and give them a round of applause? Yeah. All right. I love it. Well, without further ado, I am going to get out of the way and let the games begin. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. So the nine finalists you will hear today were selected from a larger pool. Uh, that were submitted by video back in January. You'll see from the programs, we originally had 10. Um, I regret to let you know that Adriana Padilla Roger has had to withdraw a little bit at the last moment. Um, she's fine, um, and, and we will miss her entry. Uh, but we know that our other finalists uh, have, that we have lined up for you are going to make for a really great event. Um, the students have been working very hard to make their talks engaging, um, with the possible hope of winning the grand prize of $4,000. Second prize, $2,000. Third prize, $1,000. And People's Choice Award, worth $750, um, is uh, something that you all will get to vote in, including everybody at our online event who are watching remotely. The other way the in-person audience can participate today is in the trivia contest. So between each speaker, we will ask you a question. And the live audience member who shoots up their hand first and corrects, uh, uh, answers correctly will win a prize. 
I know you're very anxious to hear from our students. Um, and before we get started, I just want to briefly introduce our judging panel. So would you please stand up as I call your name? First, we have Erin Alday, health reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, also a UC Berkeley alumna. We have Juan Ha, UCSF's Vice Chancellor for Communications. He will be an eager, eager audience member. Uh, Dr. Catherine Lucy, Executive Vice Dean, Vice Dean for Education and Professor of Medicine in UCSF School of Medicine. Leticia Marquez Magana, Professor of Biology and the Director of the Health Equity Research Lab at San Francisco State. And our very own Don Woodson, director of UCSF Center for Science, Education, and Outreach. Thank you so much to all of you for being here with us and for your careful consideration of our entries. Um, the judges will be looking for these basic qualities in the student presentations. Did the topic, did the presentation help the audience understand the research? Was the topic where the dissertation topic and its significance communicated using language appropriate to an educated but non-specialized audience? And did the presentation make the audience want to know more about the research? And as you may know, each talk will be timed, and any presentation that goes over three minutes will be disqualified, so the pressure is on. Our official timer is UCSF Registrar Doug Carlson. Uh, Doug is an expert. <laughs> He is also the official timekeeper for Cal sports teams. And most recently, he was timekeeping the San Francisco-based March Madness college basketball tournament. Very impressive credentials. Finally, please silence your cell phones. I know we're out of practice on that one. <laughs> We don't want anything to distract the students who will need to harness all their concentration to make, uh, to make their presentation timely and to deliver their talks. Also, no talking, texting, or flash photography during the presentations. You're welcome to take all sorts of other photos. Are the judges ready? All right. Our finalists drew numbers to determine the order in which they will speak. So our first speaker is Neha Prasad. Neha is a student in the Chemistry and Chemical Biology program. Her dissertation advisor is Ian Seipel, and her talk is entitled, Our Friend the Phage. wild that doctors can just cut a patient open, stick some metal inside their body, stitch the mesh shut, and happily send the patient home? Two million Americans get a hip or knee replacement surgery every year. And if you catch a bacterial infection during the surgery, no problem. Here's an antibiotic to cure your infection. But in 30 years from now, when our generation shows up with our creaking and groaning joints, that routine surgery may not even be an option for us anymore because death from an infected surgery site is becoming a very real risk. The truth is many medical interventions from catheters to ventilators and chemotherapy are safe today only because we can cure secondary bacterial infections with antibiotics. But bacteria figured out how to beat these antibiotics. And in 30 years from now, more than 10 million people that's close to the population of LA are on track to be dying from untreatable bacterial infections every year. Now in search of a new way to kill bacteria, we remember the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It turns out that our enemy, bacteria, have a natural enemy called phage. Phage are viruses that invade and kill only bacteria, and they're being developed as a new way to treat bacterial infections. So will phage solve our death by bacteria problem? Well, almost. Phage put up a pretty good offense, but many times the bacteria's defense is too powerful and the phage invasion flat out fails. However, if we were to sabotage the bacteria's defense, the phage could then launch a successful invasion. 
my research finds ways to effectively sabotage bacteria so that phage can launch a successful invasion and kill bacteria that they otherwise could not. I use a genetic strategy called CRISPR-I to sabotage bacteria in different ways and test how easily phage can kill those compromised bacteria. I call these bacteria compromised because with CRISPR-I sabotage, a gene that is typically expressed at this level is now only expressed at this lower level. Each of the hundreds of bacteria in my collection have a different compromised gene, allowing me to survey hundreds of sabotage strategies at once. When exposed to phage, a few of these bacteria died, meaning that lowering the expression of those specific bacterial genes made the bacteria more vulnerable to phage invasion. To now translate this finding in a new, um, as a new treatment option, we can design a chemical inhibitor that mimics our winning genetic sabotage strategy. You can think of it like a two-punch knockout in boxing. First, a chemical inhibitor that <laughs> sabotages the bacteria, and then a phage that exploits that vulnerability to kill the bacteria. So when we uh, narrowly dodge the antibiotic resistance apocalypse, remember to thank our friend, the phage. Thank you, Neha. Now for our first trivia question. Are you interested in the intersection between science and politics? All of the trivia questions today will in some way relate to science and politics. And for those who are viewing our event remotely, this will be a bit like watching Jeopardy. In other words, sorry, no prizes for you. Uh, but we hope you'll have fun guessing anyway. For our live audience, please raise your hand if you think you know the answer. We have some UCSF swag for you if you get it right. Um, we don't have any mics in the audience, so we're going to ask you to, to project your voices, and I will repeat the answer you give. And of course, no Googling. Thank you. Um, once the questions have been answered correctly, um, I will tell you some more fun facts about our, our trivia question. So first question, how many PhD holding, formerly practicing scientists, are there in current con Congress? <laughs> Come on, somebody take a guess. Dino. I, what is two? <laughs> in, sorry, he said, what is two? Incorrect. 25. The answer given was 25, also incorrect. Four. Ooh. <laughs> We're going to be here a little while. Sorry, also incorrect. I'll, I'll say lower. I saw that hand, black cap. Lower. Down the front. Zero. Oh. Yellow shirt. One. 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 I had no idea what that answer was. There are a few mathematicians and medical doctors in Congress, but only one sitting congressperson who has a PhD in science, and that is Bill Foster, representing the 11th district in Illinois. Foster spent 22 years as a high energy particle physicist. He helped discover the top quark, the heaviest known form of matter, and designed one of the last of the giant particle accelerators in the US. He also has a bit of a sense of humor. Um, he, when becoming a member of Congress, yeah, he, he became known for that nerdy sense of humor. And at the groundbreaking ceremony of the Fermi Lab in the Nova Neutrino Experiment, he had his own take on the Gettysburg Address, opening with four score and seven kilometers south. Our accelerators brought forth on this continent a neutrino beam conceived of protons and dedicated to testing the proposition that all neutrinos are equal. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> now it's time for our next speaker. Um, Gokul Ramadas. Gokul is in the Biomedical Sciences program. His dissertation advisors are Bruce, Con uh, Bruce Conklin and Martin Kompman, and his title, his talk is titled, Get Your Genes Tailored. There are three billion letters inside your DNA, and a single typo can be a death sentence. 
Like one form of a brain disease we study called ALS, where a single letter C turns into a T, and patients are left paralyzed as they die just a few years later. Brain diseases as a whole are projected to become the second leading cause of death worldwide. So if we had the tools to go in and fix those fatal typos, we could save millions of lives. That's the problem I'm trying to solve by building a toolkit for what I call DNA surgery in neurons. Our first tool is a protein called Cas9 that acts a lot like a bounty hunter. We give it a wanted poster, identifying a troublesome sequence of DNA for it to hunt down and cut open. So that's our surgical scalpel. But to use it for brain diseases, we needed a second tool that didn't exist yet, a tool to deliver controlled amounts of the Cas9 protein into a patient's neurons. So I spent the first few years of my PhD working with collaborators to engineer tiny particles that do exactly that. And it worked. My data shows that our most optimized particles are now incredibly efficient at delivering controlled doses of Cas9 into neurons to cut open their DNA. But then what? Surgery is more than just cutting someone open. It turns out what happens to a cell's DNA after Cas9 cuts it open is really just left up to chance. And nobody's ever been able to test what happens in neurons. But our particles allowed me to do that experiment. And I discovered that neurons have a unique tendency unlike other cells. Intriguingly, when we cut open that problematic DNA, neurons insist on stitching it back the way it was leaving the mutation unchanged instead of cured. It's like if you surgically removed a cancerous patch from a patient's skin, but then they stitched it back on exactly how it was before. I'm now studying how exactly the neurons are doing this, because the third tool I'm developing is a way to shift that probability back towards the cured outcome instead. To do this, we're right now testing a specially designed panel of drugs to try and stop neurons from resisting our DNA surgery, almost like anesthesia. Uh, Pre-treating patients with one of these drugs could hopefully result in a higher percentage of their neurons being saved. I hope these tools can help us finally cure those devastating genetic brain diseases like ALS. Because for many, getting your genes tailored is truly a matter of life or death. Thank you. Thank you, Gokul. Um, so we have our second question. This one should be easier. What former, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, hands down. What former, now I gotta read it and watch very closely. What former German chancellor earned a PhD in quantum chemistry from the German Academy of Sciences? Uh, purple shirt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Angela Merkel. <laughs> Merkel, who is Chancellor of Germany from 2005 through the end of 2021, earned her first degree in chemistry, sorry, in physics and physical chemistry at the University of Leipzig before getting the PhD. She worked as a chemist in the academy until the fall of the Berlin Wall pushed her towards a career in politics. When she was a chancellor, Merkel was often described as the de facto leader of the European Union, sometimes the most powerful woman in the world, and occasionally as the leader of the free world. She proved herself to be a formidable leader in challenging circumstances, uniting East and West Germany and growing a prosperous economy. Merkel's chemistry, this is a Janine joke, those of you who know Janine, Merkel's chemistry with a certain former president was famously not super great though. <laughs> Thank you, Janine. <laughs> um, so now we have our third speaker, Jack Stevenson. Jack is a student in the Chemistry and Chemical Biology program. His dissertation advisor is Kayvon Shokat, and his talk is entitled, Learning the Tricks of the Most Valuable Protein, How Your Cells Decide to Divide. Every one of you started off life as one single cell. That first cell divided into two cells, and those two divided into four, and today you're each made of about 40 trillion cells. But you won't be 80 trillion cells tomorrow. 
all of your cells are constantly deciding whether to keep dividing or whether to stop. Usually they only divide when they're supposed to, but when some of your cells start dividing out of control, that's what we call cancer. Both to fight cancer and to learn how you grew into the person you are today, I'm studying how your cells decide whether or not to divide. Here's what we know about this decision. It's determined by something like a tiny game of paintball being played in every cell in your body. The players, who are all proteins, are divided into two teams, Team Divide and Team Don't Divide, and they try to tag each other with paint. This paint is actually a chemical mark that turns a protein off. If Team Divide tags out everyone on Team Don't Divide, then the cell divides. We also know that Team Divide has an MVP. This most valuable protein is really effective at tagging out key proteins on the other team and getting the cell to divide. When it does too good a job, it can give you cancer. But even though we know who this MVP is, and we know that the proteins it's tagging must be important, we actually don't know exactly which proteins it is tagging. That's what I'm trying to find out. Now, I wish I could just watch this game happen and see the MVP tag people and then tell you all about it. But unfortunately, this is really tiny paintball, so I can't see it happen in real time. What I can do is look at all the players after the match is over and see who has paint on them and who doesn't. How does this tell me who's getting tagged by the MVP? Well, it doesn't quite. The problem is everyone's using the same color of paint. So when I look at all the players, I can't tell which orange splat came from who. The way I'm trying to solve this mystery is by doing an experiment where I give the MVP of Team Divide a special color of paint to tag people with, a special kind of chemical mark, but let's call it blue paint. Then when I look at all the players, I can easily see who has blue on them. They must have been tagged by the MVP. These proteins that the MVP of Team Divide is tagging are probably important for controlling cell division, maybe in ways that we don't understand yet. And once I identify them, we'll be one step closer to designing better drugs to stop Team Divide from winning in cancer cells. And also one step closer to understanding how you grew from one single cell into a person who can sit here and hear me talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. All right, time for our third question. Dr. Pritesh Gandhi, a medical doctor, ran for US Congress in the 10th District of Texas, which includes this city, sometimes called Silicon Hills, as it is a major center for technology companies. Down here. Austin, Austin yes. And Nikkei over here is going, come on, everybody should know that. She's from Texas. <laughs> uh, Houston-born, first-generation American, Pratesh Gandhi has a long track record of serving the underserved. As a Fulbright scholar, he worked in one of the world's largest landfills where he saw families organized to obtain access to clean water. As an Albert Schweitzer fellow, he focused on nutrition among the working poor in Boston. During his medical residency in New Orleans, he was involved in efforts to curb gun violence. Gandhi's run for Congress was ultimately unsuccessful. However, in 2021, he was appointed by the then newly elected President Biden as Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Silicon Hills has been a nickname for Austin since the mid-90s. High-tech industries in the area include semiconductors, software, video game industry, and increasingly biotech and pharma companies, so potential destination for you after you graduate. This city has become a top draw for tech workers in part because the cost of living is much lower than those in other tech hubs locate, located across the U.S. Now we have our fourth, uh, fourth finalist, Megan Chong. Megan is a student in the Tetrad program. Her dissertation advisor is Sophie Dumont, and her talk is entitled, Nobody's Perfect, But Dividing Cells Can Work It. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. Everybody knows what, what I'm talking about. Everybody gets that way. Nobody's perfect. I gotta work it. Everybody makes mistakes. But what about ourselves? 
For my thesis, I'm studying how cells avoid mistakes as they divide from one cell into two. For context, inside each of us, millions of cells are dividing right now. Each time, they build the spindle, a machine that attaches to chromosomes, lines them up, and pulls them evenly into two new cells. Making mistakes here can have disastrous consequences. Having the wrong number of chromosomes can lead to developmental disorders and to cancer. But nobody can be perfect all the time, right? So how do cells avoid the many possible pitfalls and dead ends that would lead to disease and instead manage to build a spindle that can divide our chromosomes so well every time? I'll tell you a secret. First, cells make a lot of mistakes. They build spindles that attach to chromosomes in the wrong orientation, or they miss some altogether, and then they correct those mistakes. You can think of it like solving a maze. If I plopped you down in a maze you'd never seen before, maybe you'd get lucky for a while, but eventually you'd make a wrong turn. So what if instead you had a trick or a rule? If you get lost in a maze, you can find your way out from any point by keeping one hand on the wall beside you as you wind your way through. Your path will be more roundabout, but you'll definitely reach the end. So what rules do dividing cells use to fix their mistakes or to realize there's a mistake? To understand this better, we can look at the mistakes we see cells make and try to find patterns. In my research, I've seen that the spindle makes more mistakes trying to attach to big chromosomes than to short ones. Instead of attaching both sides to opposite halves of the spindle, these big chromosomes often attach both sides to just one side of the spindle. So is that because of the identity of the chromosomes, or is it just because they're long? To test this, I use a laser to cut chromosome arms, making them shorter, and then watch cells on a microscope. I find that these cut chromosomes attach correctly soon after I make the cut. So why would being short help chromosomes fix their mistakes? It turns out all our chromosomes are coded in a special motor protein that generates a pushing force on chromosome arms leading to chromosome stretching. On large chromosomes with lots of this motor, we think this uh, mimics the stretch of correctly attached chromosomes, which are being pulled in opposite directions by the two spindle halves. So when I cut chromosomes, it reduces this stretch, allowing cells to realize there was a mistake. We don't know yet how cells detect errors without me firing a laser, but that's what my research aims to figure out. We hope this will help us target diseases with many cell division errors. So remember, it's not about the mistakes. It's all about how we deal with them. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I didn't know that trick for getting out of a maze. Now I know. What, sorry, question four, in case you didn't know. <laughs> what former American president graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1946 and then went on to pursue graduate studies in nuclear physics at Union College in New York? Jimmy Carter. Well done. <laughs> Uh, Carter is the U.S.'s 39th president, graduated near the top of his class in the Naval Academy, and might have become a nuclear engineer, but his father died and left, uh, and he felt an obligation to take over his family's peanut farm. Historians and political scientists usually rank Carter as only an average president, mm. uh, but his post-presidency work through the Carter Center to expand uh, human rights and advance disease prevention and eradication in developing nations is very widely admired. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002. One of the Carter Center's successes has been to nearly eradicate the debilitating guinea worm disease. In 1986, the disease afflicted an estimated 3.5 million people a year in 21 different countries. Today, thanks to the work of the Carter Center and its partners, including country, the countries themselves, the incidence of guinea worm have been reduced by more than 99.99% to just 15 one five provisional cases in 2021. Very impressive. Uh, now we have our fifth speaker. Um, before we begin, I want to let our audience know that this will be our first ever Spanish language talk. <laughs> Woo! Woo! 
So for the live stream audience, you should know that the translation will not be immediately available to you. You will see the closed captioning in Spanish. Um, and for our audience in the room, you will see the surtitles on the slide. So now for our fifth speaker, Lucia Abascal Miguel. Lucia is in the Global Health Sciences Program. Her dissertation advisor is Margaret Handley, and her talk is entitled No Le oh, Sorry, No Le Pides Peras al Olmo, Olmo, Don't Ask the Elm Tree for Pears. Podrás imaginarte desde afuera Ser un mexicano cruzando la frontera Pensando tu familia mientras que pasas Dejando todo lo que tú conoces atrás Si tuvieras... Guiándonos por las estadísticas de California, el 25% de las personas escuchándome no necesitarían leer las traducciones al inglés. Lamentablemente, otra estadística juega en mi contra, ya que menos del 5% de los trabajadores y científicos del Estado son latinos y todavía menos hablan español. La pandemia del COVID-19 ha impactado de manera desproporcional a los latinos, no solo a los que viven en Latinoamérica, sino también en Estados Unidos. En California, los latinos representan el 48% de los casos y el 44% de las muertes. Tenemos vacunas altamente efectivas y seguras contra el COVID-19, pero a pesar de esto, poblaciones en alto riesgo siguen enfrentando barreras estructurales y falta de acceso a ellas. Entre las bar barreras más importantes que se han identificado está la, la falta de información culturalmente apropiada y a nuestro idioma. En abril 2020 empecé a trabajar como médico en rastreo de contactos. Y después, cuando las vacunas estuvieron disponibles, me enfoqué en estas. Las recomendaciones de salud pública parecen sencillas, pero imagínense pedirle a una persona que comparte un departamento de un cuarto con 10 personas que se aísle. O a un señor analfabeta que saque una cita para vacunarse por internet. Como decimos en español, no le pidas peras al olmo. Por eso existe la ciencia de la implementación, para ayudarnos a cerrar la brecha entre lo que sabemos y lo que hacemos. Al al entender barreras que enfrenta la población a seguir intervenciones basadas en evidencia. Ante esta realidad, el Departamento de Salud Pública de San Francisco nos pidió que lleváramos a cabo un estudio para entender las barreras que tienen los latinos para prevenir el COVID-19. Empezamos evaluando intervenciones no farmacológicas y cuando las vacunas estuvieron disponibles, las incluimos. Usando un modelo conductual de ciencias de la implementación, realicé entrevistas cualitativas en español entre una muestra de contactos. Las barreras más comunes incluían un sistema sanitario poco preparado, la falta de información sobre vacunas, la desinformación y la información contradictoria. Finalmente, usamos, vinculamos las políticas e intervenciones a las barreras identificadas. Las intervenciones que más funcionarían son la educación y la reestructuración del entorno. Y las políticas más importantes se centran en la comunicación y el marketing. Eh, con nuestros resultados, informamos las campañas de vacunación de la ciudad de San Francisco y del condado. Y así conseguí un trabajo en el Departamento de Salud Pública del Estado de California. Y actualmente soy portavoz de su campaña de vacunación en español. En la salud pública no existe una sola medida para todos, pero todos necesitamos medidas. Thank you, Lucia. All right, our next question. Dr. Jasmine Clark, a legislator in the state of Georgia's House of Representatives, earned her PhD at this research-focused university in Atlanta. Emery. Emery, well done. An article in the Emory Wheel entitled, Leg uh, sorry, entitled Legislator with a Lab Coat notes that Clark unseated her opponent on a platform that called for a larger role in, of science in politics. Clark's taste for politics began in her role as director of the first March for Science in Atlanta in April 2017. Once she became involved in the march, Clark saw a clear need to bring her perspective, one rooted in scientific data and rigorous logic, into lawmaking. She said, maybe the reason politicians are not using scientific data is because they don't understand it. Not to disparage people without PhDs or people who don't understand statistics, I just think it's helpful to have someone in the room who does. 
Emory Healthcare, part of the university, is the largest healthcare system in the state of Georgia. Prominent scientists affiliated with the university include faculty member William Fogey, who is credited for the global eradication of smallpox, and alumnus Thomas Milton Rivers, who headed the National Science Foundation's successful search for a polio vaccine. All right, so our next speaker is Colin Germer. Colin is in the Pharmaceutical Sciences and Pharmacogenomics program. His dissertation advisor is Aparna Lakaraju, and his, title, his talk is titled, Hearing What the Eyes Say. Hey, just a heads up that you can read along with my speech here. Oh, well that's illegible. But that's the reality for 196 million people across the globe who suffer from a blinding disease known as age-related macular degeneration. And that number is only going to grow thanks to both an aging population and a lack of effective therapies for the disease. Once it progresses to this stage, vision is lost and can't ever be recovered. The vital component of vision is the retina, a thin layer of neural tissue at the back of the eye that contains specialized light sensing cells called the photoreceptors. But the photoreceptors are busy cells, they've got all these signals to send about how bright something is, what color it is, and where it's going. Much like a busy grad student, they really don't have the time to take care of themselves. And this lack of self-care can negatively impact their health and vision as a whole. This is where the retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE, comes in. The RPE is situated underneath the photoreceptors and is responsible for their care and upkeep at only just a cell thick. The RPE feeds the photoreceptors, cleans up after them, and more importantly, protects them. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the, our, when the uh, RPE, uh, unfortunately the RPE cannot do everything alone, and one of the ways in which it communicates through the retina is through teeny tiny little bubbles called exosomes. These bubbles are just a few dozen nanometers in size. So what I decided to do was, in, in order to listen in on what the RPE was saying in the retina overall, I isolated these exosomes and examined their contents. As it turns out, healthy RPE communicate at about the level of your grandparents. Not too often, and it usually comes with good stuff. Healthy RPE only produce about a few thousand exosomes per cell per day, and these exosomes are packed with anti-inflammatory cargo that promotes cell health and preservation. But sick RPE, like those found in age-related macular degeneration, are more like spam bots, way too many emails, and often with stressful contents. These RPE produced more than double the number of exosomes of their counterparts, and they were full of cargo that promoted inflammation and stress in neighboring cells. Fortunately, there's a method through which these exosomes are made that can be affected by antidepressants of all things. By treating these cells with antidepressants, I was able to reduce the overall amount of exosomes produced by more than half. This, in turn, reduced the amount of stress and inflammation that neighboring cells received, sort of like a spam blocker for your phone. It's my hope that this reduction of, cellular produ of exosomal production reduces overall amount of cellular stress that is received and, in turn, pr re preserves cellular health. My hope is that eventually that this preservation of cellular health will result in a preservation of functional vision. And while it's still a little bit too early for me to say anything on that topic, my outlook regarding that is pretty bright. Thank you for listening. Thank you. All right, our next question is a quote. As Secretary of Energy, I was reminded daily that science must continue to be elevated and integrated into our national life, said by this Obama appointee and UC Berkeley alum. Stephen Chu, well done. <laughs> Stephen Chu is a Nobel Prize winner for his pioneering research in cooling and trapping atoms using laser light. Stephen Chu was Secretary of Energy during Obama's first term and the first scientist to head the Department of Energy, the institutional home of the nation's 17 national laboratories. At the time of his appointment he, as Energy Secretary, Chu was a professor of physics and molecular cellular biology at UC Berkeley and the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where his research was primarily concerned with the study of biological systems at the single molecule level. 
Chu stepped down as Secretary of Energy in April 2013 and then rejoined the faculty at Stanford, where he had been appointed through most of the 90s. He remains a vocal advocate for science and, in particular, for more research into renewable energy. All right. We have our next finalist, Wei Gordon is a PhD in the Tetra, or sorry, is working towards a PhD in the Tetra program. Got it a little ahead of myself there. Don't get too excited. Uh, her, her dissertation advisor is Nadav Ahituv, and her talk is entitled Uncovering the Sweet Secrets of Fruit-Eating Mammals. We eat too much sugar. I just wolf down bowls of Cinnamon Toast Crunch to get myself extra jazz for Grad Slam. But really, it's impossible to avoid sugar. Diabetes is the eighth leading cause of death in the US, and more than one in three adults are pre-diabetic. So how can we alleviate some negative consequences of a high sugar diet? We can learn something from mammals that specialize on a high sugar diet. These mammals include fruit-eating bats and primates. Though we know fruit eaters eat more sugar, yet lower their blood sugar faster than non-fruit eaters, we don't know how traits like this arose at the molecular level. Little changes or mutations in DNA can result in changes to traits. Traits are encoded by DNA sequences called genes. Mutations in genes change traits but mutations in DNA sequences around genes, called gene regulatory regions, change traits too. You can think of these regions as conductors. If genes are the instruments in an orchestra that creates a living being, then gene regulatory regions are the conductors that control when, where, and how much an instrument is played. I'm not the first person to ask a fruit eater, what sugar secrets are you hiding? Previous investigators have focused on finding mutations in genes, but only a few have been found. Because no one has examined gene regulatory regions, the conductors, I look to find mutations there that lead to fruit eater traits. I analyze DNA of over 100 mammals to identify sequences with mutations only in fruit eaters. I found thousands. The next step was to test if these mutated sequences are gene regulatory regions. I selected a handful of sequences and I put them in front of genes that can light up into cells. If a sequence is a gene regulatory region, then a light gene is instructed to produce light I can see. Every fruit eater sequence I tested gave light. I was lit with excitement. <laughs> Did I find sugar secrets? To test if the regulatory regions I discovered affect sugar metabolism, I put the fruit eater sequences into a non-fruit eater, the mouse, and I'm examining mouse development and response to high sugar. My regulatory region database offers secrets for high sugar adaptation. This can assist therapeutic developments like metabolic diseases like diabetes. I'm not saying I found a reason for us to eat as much cinnamon toast crunch as we'd like, but I may have found a reason life can be just a little bit sweeter. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. All right, our next question. This former British Prime Minister earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the University of Oxford. Right? Margaret, Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. Well done. Thatcher specialized in X-ray crystallography and studied with Nobel laureate Dorothy Hodgkin, developer of protein crystallography. Working as a researcher after graduation, she helped to develop emulsifiers for ice cream, didn't know that, uh, before starting her career in politics. Thatcher was one of the first world leaders to address the issue of global warming. In 1990, she gave a speech at the Second World Climate Conference in Geneva saying our ability to come together to stop or limit damages to the world's environment will be perhaps the greatest test of how far we can act as a world community. On ozone depletion and the reduced use of chlorofluorocarbons, in refrigeration and aerosols, she was a great champion and willingly signed up to the Montreal Protocol in 1988. 
In a 1988 speech to the Royal Society, she said, as a rule, scientists rarely make successful politicians, but in today's world, it is no bad thing for a politician to have the benefit of a scientific background. All right, we have our eighth speaker, Kelly Montgomery. Kelly is in the Chemistry and Chemical Biology program, and her dissertation advisor is Jason Guestwicky. And her talk is entitled Paper Cranes and Paper Balls Unfolding the Causes of Dementia. Everyone has a memory that they never want to forget. Maybe it's the day you learn to ride your bike or the day you finally mastered your favorite craft, like boating a paper crane. But as we age, the details of these memories can become fuzzy. Fuzzy memories aren't uncommon. In fact, they're pretty normal, unless you're in a very serious case where you, in a very serious case, in instances where it causes, in very instances where cellular damage is caused by diseases like dementia. In this instance, people experience a progressive and debilitating loss of brain function caused by dying brain cells. A healthy brain does a fantastic job of preventing brain cells from dying by employing cellular machinery to ensure that the brain is free of unnecessary clutter. An unhealthy brain, however, suffers because it can't remove cellular junk as effectively. For patients experiencing cognitive decline, this cellular junk is crumpled up molecules in the brain called proteins. I personally think that proteins are so fascinating because of the many ways that they can bend and fold. In many ways, proteins are actually quite similar to paper. They both begin as an unstructured sheet that can be intentionally folded into a unique structure like origami. But not all proteins end up as neatly folded paper cranes. An example of this is a protein called tau. Tau really wants to be a paper crane, but no matter how hard it tries, it always ends up crumpled up instead and becomes one of those pesky proteins that crumples up and causes brain cells to die. I'm researching how and why tau crumples up to give brain cells a fighting chance. But here's the thing about tau. Tau can't crumple up on its own. In fact, it needs some sort of a cellular accomplice to help it do its dirty work. But no one knows what the cellular accomplice is. I really wanted to figure this out. So I decided to test every possible thing that lives inside of a cell to see if it would help crumple tau. To do this, I mix all of the possible cellular accomplices together with tau, and I monitor crumpling over time. And what I found was interesting. It's not just one cellular accomplice, it's many different types of molecules like sugars and fats and bits of other proteins that are all helping tau try to fold, not knowing that they're putting the brain at risk. And while there's still a lot to learn about how these molecules are doing what they're doing, identifying them is the first step in preventing it. And by calling each of them out by name, I've been able to iron out yet another wrinkle in the mystery of dementia so that one day, we can all recall the memories we never want to forget. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. All right. Dr. Blake, you will know the answer to this one. Uh, but we'll let the students have a chance. <laughs> in 2019, astronaut, physician, and engineer Mae Jameson spoke before the U.S. House of Representatives on achieving the promise of a diverse STEM workforce. She is also the first real-life astronaut to appear in this science fiction TV series. Purple shirt right there. Star Trek. Star Trek. Which one? <laughs> he got it. He pulled it out, folks. Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> Dr. May Carol Jameson earned undergraduate degrees in both chemical engineering and African, uh, African and African American studies at Stanford, and then a medical degree at Cornell. 
After working as a doctor in the Peace Corps and a stint in vaccine research at the CDC, she started her career at NASA, where she became the first black woman to go to space in 1987. Shortly after Jameson's departure from NASA in 1993, LeVar Burton, who had a prominent role in the Next Generation series, found out that Jameson was a huge Star Trek fan and invited her to play a small guest role on an episode he was directing. Jameson is also a friend of Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura, on the original Star Trek series, and Jameson sa- who Jameson says first inspired her to be an astronaut. Always boldly going, Jameson has since then started a consulting firm, a medical technology corporation, and a foundation, somehow always finding the time to do charity work and public speaking. She especially loves to work with young people, inspiring them to pursue science and technology, and you really should read her bio. It's way longer than I could cover here, so definitely go check her out. All right, we are now ready for our ninth and final speaker. Rachel Nakagawa. Rachel is in the Biomedical Sciences PhD program. Her dissertation advisor is Andre Goga, and her talk is entitled Deconstructing Tumor Cell Interactions. Cancer is complicated. And that complexity can make solid tumors very difficult to treat. While solid tumors are often thought of as just being this uniform cancerous mass, a single tumor is actually made up of a diverse community of tumor-causing cells. We can visualize this by imagining a multicolored mass of cells where the different colors, such as blue or orange or red, represent unique tumor cell populations. My project explores the question that these different colored tumor cell populations are all working together for survival. The reason we need to understand if these different tumor cells can help each other to survive is because therapies may ultimately fail if the different colored tumor populations are all working together to resist treatment. So to understand if these different tumor cells are working together, all we need to do is understand all the ways that the millions of cells in these multicolored tumors are interacting. As you can probably guess, that is extremely challenging. It's kind of like trying to eavesdrop at a crowded party. Between the music and the background voices, it is almost impossible to pinpoint and fully understand a single conversation in such a chaotic environment. For my thesis work, I attempt to overcome these challenges by building up the tumor complexity from scratch. If we're still trying to eavesdrop at that party, This would be like allowing just a few people into the party at a time, giving me more control in identifying, one, what is noise versus conversation, two, what exactly is being said, and three, how are these people interacting? Do they talk with just their friends or the entire room? Thinking back to that multicolored tumor, I take just two different colored cancer cell populations, let's say blue and red, and I grow them together. From this work, I've discovered that the blue and red cancer cells can actually communicate by shuttling information from one cell population to the other, suggesting these cells talk with each other to work together. What's more is these cells will actually self-organize when mixed, showing that cancer cells might be picky about who they directly talk to and interact with. Beyond even what I was expecting, I've also found that growing the blue and red cancer cells together results in faster growth and improved survival under stress for both cell populations, demonstrating that cancer cells can work together for the benefit of the entire tumor. By continuing to deconstruct how these different colored tumor cell populations interact, we can better design drugs to interfere with their ability to work together and more effectively destroy the entire tumor. Thank you. All right, let's bring our speakers down for a big round of applause. Come on down. All right. (laughs) 
take a bow. Well done. It is so nice to be back in person, (laughs) y'all. So we want to make sure everybody has a chance to vote. Don't forget we have our People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite talk to win the People's Choice Award. Go to the URL that's on the screen. Oh, it's on you. Oh, oh, there we go. There you go. Um, You can use the QR code or go to the URL. Um, if you're remotely, you can link, um, click right on the link in your video in the browser. Um, take a minute to think about it, but please submit within 10 minutes. We got a pretty strict cutoff, so you've got until 5.09. We might give you until 5.10. Uh, while the judges are whisked away to a top secret location to decide on today's winners, um, take a short break, stretch your legs. Um, please definitely come back because you're going to want to see who wins. So come back into this room at about 525. Dr. Blake will be coming back to the stage to announce the winners. Um, And then, of course, you can watch the announcement remotely, too. So thank you. Thanks, everybody.
going. We're not ready yet. I'm so sorry. We're, we're waiting for our envelopes. <laughs> you really do just have to stand up here and everybody gets quiet. So powerful. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, before we go on to the final awardees, I wanna just take a moment to thank some really special and important people who made this happen for us today. Um, the judges, um, both our screening judges and our final judges, thank you so much. We also have a number of coaches who assisted the students, helped the students polish their talks. We also have the team from Education Technology Services who are responsible for our live stream, um, who got us closed captioning for the first time this year, which we're really, really glad to have. Um, they've been running all the AV, and of course our staff in the graduate division and student academic affairs, all these folks that you saw as you walked in who volunteered their time. And a special shout out to our graduate division communications team who organized a grad slam contest from soup to nuts, Eric Rotman and Janine Cuevas. <laughs> and we actually have a special little thank you for Janine. This is her 10th slam event. She was there from the beginning and it is her last slam event. And we are so grateful. We have a little award for you. You can ask her what it means later. <laughs> but we are giving her the golden pine cone. And now the moment you've been waiting for. Nikkei is going to award the finalists. I really wish I were awarding the finalists. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like, I don't know, Jeopardy guy or somebody. I'm about to like announce the Grammys. All right, the first award is for, is the People's Choice Award. The winner will get $750. And the winner, this is so exciting of the People's Choice Award is, yes, listen to that. <gasps> Gokuld Ramados. <laughs> Young man.
the third place winner for the 2022 Grand Slam is... Lucia Abascal Miguel. Woo! Um, that 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 was a thousand dollars. And I'm I'm gonna guess in this age it's dropped into your account at five o'clock or something. <laughs> All right. And <clears throat> the second place winner for two thousand dollars is Rachel Nakagawa. <laughs> For the moment, the winner of the 2022 Grand Slam event. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Way Gordon. <laughs> want to go home with a check like that. <laughs> All right. Um, congratulations, everyone. I, I, don't, I don't think I've had this much fun since I've been in San Francisco. So thank you all <laughs> for... <laughs> A huge thank you um, to the finalists, to the judges, to all the people who have put together to make this event such a success. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening.